Working as an EMT can be one of the most rewarding job experiences you can have. It gives you the chance to help people, to save lives and to make a real difference. It can also be downright terrifying. I am Fearcrawler. Welcome to the video. We responded to a sick call at about 4 a.m. Dispatch said he was a hospice patient with a history of cancer, who had not eaten for a couple of days and had pulled out his medication port. We get there and it's this poor guy in his early 40s. He's bald from chemo and he's sitting on his brother's couch. His skin was blotchy, pale and purple, and he was hyperventilating and diaphoretic. His sister-in-law said he had been pacing from the bed to the couch all night, clearly agitated. We went out to get the stretcher and when we came back in, he had soiled himself. He just kept saying, No. No. And looking around the room, flinching every now and then like he was waving away flies. We got him to sit on the stretcher, and he said, No. Not now. We tried to reassure him and we rolled him out. The medic I was with asked me to get do not resuscitate papers because, quote, He's doing it right now. I walked up to his brother and his sister-in-law, got the papers and returned just in time to see him cry a couple of big tears, sob a little, and then crumple. I had to tell his brother that he had passed. And it's not easy to see a man drop to his knees in the driveway and wail. I got into the ambulance and I prepared to drive to the ER. As I wondered if the man would go to heaven, I got a bad feeling, like darkness was creeping all around us. I happened to look down at the voltmeter, and I saw the number 666 flashing. This panel normally doesn't flash at all, it just reads voltage. It went 666, then point 0.1, then 666 again, then back down to point 0.1, and then back up to 666, then down to point 0.1. Finally it went back up to 1200 or so, and it stayed that way. The uneasy feeling went away, but I still prayed the whole time on their way to the hospital. I felt sick as hell all that day, and I had a violent vomiting spell later on. Poor guy. I hope he's okay now. This is a true story about an ongoing haunting that is occurring in Richmond, Virginia, at a local ambulance company just off Broad Street, near the Willow Lawn Shopping Center. My 25-year-old son-in-law has been working at this company as an EMT for approximately a year now, and he comes home weekly with new haunting stories. The small brick building was once a warehouse of some type, and during a fire many years ago, several people were trapped inside and died. They were Hispanic migrant workers who apparently slept in the warehouse. It's now used as an ambulance company, and during the 24-hour shifts, EMT people are required to spend the night in the building. There is also a dispatcher who is always away on duty, even during the night hours. When my son-in-law first went to work there, he wondered why the sleeping cots were set up in the smaller room, rather than the larger bunk room. He was told that the larger room was haunted, and if people tried to sleep there, they'd feel cold hands on them in the night. He didn't know whether to believe this or not, but he did notice that whenever he worked a 24-hour shift and slept there, he had bad nightmares and he'd wake up to a cold, tingling feeling running up and down his spine. They think there are at least two ghosts in the building. The first is an aggressive one who bangs the chain on the bay door, walks around the bay area and slams doors, and puts his cold hands on people. The other is a woman who has been seen in the office area. She was sighted recently when two ambulance workers walked by the office window, and they saw a short, dark-haired woman in the office. Not recognizing her, they went back to find out who she was. But there was no one there. One call that will always haunt me was on an unresponsive female at about 3 in the morning. We get there and we do some pointless CPR along with the fire department. She had been dead for a while, no shockable rhythm, and clear rigor mortis. The most disturbing part was that the original caller was her 11-year-old daughter, 
who had just spent three days with her mother's corpse and called 911 because she was lonely. It also didn't help that the victim was completely naked when we arrived. So this woman was clearly struggling mentally. She went into her basement and started sawing at her wrists horizontally with a rusty hacksaw. She bleeds a good amount and then starts walking around the house. She wasn't dying quick enough, so she sat down in a chair in the middle of the living room and started going at her wrists again, this time with a pair of scissors. I was the second person inside the house, and it looked like a massacre. We searched the house top to bottom, fully expecting to find multiple dead bodies in there. I've never seen so much blood in my life. Every single room had a trail of blood in it. The woman was found on a chair in the living room. Rigor mortis had contorted her body into a really strange, unnatural pose, and her face was haunting, literally the stuff of nightmares. Her wrists had huge chunks of skin, veins, and muscle missing from them. Saying she slit her wrists was inaccurate. She had ripped them to pieces. We got a call to go out to a scene for an elderly woman with chest pains. I arrive at the house and the front door is open. We knock, hear the old woman calling out from the back, saying, I'm in the back room, in a very monotone and calm voice. My partner and I go to the back of the house, looking for this woman, and that's when we smelled it. Nothing prepares you for the smell of a rotting corpse. I've smelled it a dozen times and it never gets any less disturbing. We radio for police and ALS backup as we move through the house. We open the door to the master bedroom, and there's our patient. She is approximately 80, and she's staring at the master bedroom with these cold, dead eyes. She never once looked at us as we approached her and began talking to her. I got to the bedside and got in front of her gaze, and she just looked right through me. I turned around to see what she could possibly be looking at. And there was the source of the smell. A man, about the same age as my patient, is on the floor with very little left of his head still attached to his body. A shotgun lay on the floor next to him, and most of his head was strewn about the walls and the bathroom counter. We loaded the woman up in the ambulance, and our police backup pulled up. I don't think that woman blinked once the entire time she was in our care. I responded to a call where a janitor was dusting quite a large stone cross in the middle of a church. He had been up on a ladder cleaning when he had slipped off and proceeded to try to hold on to the cross to keep from falling. Unfortunately, the weight of the 200 pound man was too much to support. The cross fell towards him, landing on his left arm, with a part of the horizontal stone of the cross pushing his muscles and tendons out of his wrist like a squeezed toothpaste tube. Then the cross completely fell on him, splattering his brain across the floor. Quite disturbing, and definitely the most horrific and gore-filled call I had ever witnessed. I had a young woman in full liver failure. She was orange in color and she was still conscious. She asked me what I thought it would be like to die. I told her I didn't know, but I hoped it wouldn't be painful. She then asked me if I thought I would go to heaven. I told her that I believed I would. She then asked me if I thought she would go to heaven, and I told her I wasn't able to answer that question. She then told me, I'm going to heaven and I know it. I asked how she knew that, and she told me something I will never forget. She told me, I know that I am, because that man over there told me so. I asked what man, and she said, the man sitting on the end of the bench. I asked her what he looked like, and she said, he looks just like Jesus on the windows of my church. To tell you the truth, I was pretty affected by that statement. She went on to say that, he says to tell you, you're going to go to heaven too. We then prayed, 
and I will never forget that interaction between the two of us. About a week later, she passed away. I hope she made it to heaven. I was working a nice Sunday night last summer, and we hadn't been to a car or motorcycle wreck all day, so we were waiting for it. It's almost a safe bet on nice Sundays to have at least one wreck in our rural response area. We were sitting at the dinner table shooting the bull about the local substance seekers when tones dropped for a car wreck. We were heading that way when the police hit us on the radio and told us it was a car versus a deer. I've never hit a deer personally, but I've seen plenty of wrecks, so I'm thinking it would be a pretty straightforward run. Police chimed back in that they were pretty sure the guy was dead on arrival. We rolled up on the scene, and lo and behold, this dude was messed up. There was blood everywhere. Picture this. The deer. A large antler buck went through the windshield, antlers first and on the driver's side. It had been thrashing around and flaying the guy alive for a few seconds. The deer had cut itself badly going in and had bled out, but not before ripping this guy's chest open and making him unrecognizable by all standards. It was probably the most blood in a wreck I had ever seen. When I first started working as a paid EMT, I responded to a call where a biker had laid his bike down going around a curve. We thought it would be the usual road rash and maybe a few broken bones. When we pulled onto the scene, the state trooper was standing at the trunk of his patrol car, hands on the lid and puking up his last meal. I then saw the victim standing about 10 feet in front of where the Harley had come to rest against a curb. He was holding his midsection and slowly shuffling towards the wrecked bike. As I got closer, all the puzzle pieces came together. The biker was completely hammered and had taken the curb too fast. He laid the bike down on its side going approximately 40 miles per hour when it hit the raised curb. It launched him over the handlebars. Well, almost. The brake lever had impaled his abdomen and eviscerated his intestines. I have no idea how many feet were pulled out because he was following the trail back to the bike and stuffing the dirt and sand covered organs back through the wound as he went. We got him to stop, placed him on the stretcher and untangled the remaining mess from the bike. There was not much we could do for him other than clean his intestines off the best we could and keep them moist. He never even passed out. From what I had heard a few days later, he had lived, minus several feet of intestine. The call was for an older woman lying in bed. When we get there, the smell is horrendous of a dead body. There are millions of flies everywhere, and a little old lady laying in the bed alive. About five feet away, there's a body covered up by a sheet. The lady was a dementia patient and her husband, the deceased, was her primary caregiver. Based on the number of flies and the state of decomposition, the police estimated the guy had been dead for about three weeks. The woman must have been getting her food from out of the refrigerator, but it was totally empty by the time we had arrived. Creepiest part happened on the way to the hospital. When the woman said to me, I hope that nice man on the floor is okay. That's all for today's video. I do hope you enjoyed these stories. Until next time, everyone take care, be safe, and above all, stay scared.